In 1983, Toyota came to the United States for the first time. New United Motor Manufacturing, or NUMI, was a joint venture with General Motors. It was the first time Toyota would try to transplant its formidable manufacturing culture outside of Japan. They were not sure if they could do it, but they nailed it. There is a famous American Life podcast episode about the transformation at NUMI, and I highly recommend it. That was an amazing episode. I hope this video can offer you guys something new. Today, we're going to look at NUMI, Toyota's first journey to the West. But first, let me talk about the Asianometry Patreon. Early access members get to see new videos first, as well as selected references for those videos. Early access helps a lot, and I appreciate every pledge. Thanks, and on with the show. From 1975 to 1980, the number of cars exported from Japan to the United States grew at about 20% each year. This was because of the great oil shocks of the 1970s, which had sent gas prices to new highs, fueling demand for smaller, more efficient Japanese cars. By 1980, Japanese car imports had grown to be five times higher than what they were in the 1970s, selling at about 2 million cars for 21% of the market. Meanwhile, the big three American companies had lost over 20% of their sales from their 1977 peak. By August 1980, over a quarter of a million people had been laid off from their jobs at those companies. Trade tensions rose. That year, the United Auto Workers of America Union and Ford filed a petition with the FTC. Several import quota bills started working their way through Congress. To try and defuse the situation, in 1981, the Reagan administration and the Japanese government negotiated and signed the Voluntary Restraint Agreement. The agreement limited the number of cars exported to the United States with a yearly quota assigned to each of the big Japanese automakers. This agreement would be renewed for several years afterwards. The voluntary agreement gave the Japanese automakers a choice, either accept capped growth in the United States for the foreseeable future, or build a U.S. factory. The choice was heavily debated back in Japan. Building in the U.S. would ease tensions, build brand recognition, and circumvent future tariffs. But there was also quiet concern. The Japanese believed that their advantages in cars were rooted in their own Japanese-ness, or so to say, hard-working workers, low wages, lifetime employment, supportive government, and cooperative unions. Japan's Nikko Research issued a report in 1981 concluding, In general, the quality of American blue-collar workers is lower than that of Japanese workers in terms of education, ability, turnover, and morale, and this is the biggest obstacle to the transfer of technology from Japan. Negative news about the quality of American-made goods swirled about. Can an American plant produce cars with the same efficiency and cost as those in Japan? Two of the Japanese automakers quickly decided to go for it. Honda had been scouting for an American factory as early as 1974. They eventually chose to site their first factory in the rural community of Marysville, technically Allen Township, in Ohio. That first factory started with motorcycles, since those were their forte and were also easier to build. Later in 1980, they added an automotive car assembly line. The first cars rolled off the line two years later. At about the same time in April 1980, Nissan announced a light truck assembly plant in the city of Smyrna, Tennessee. Like with Honda, this factory later added a passenger car line too. With their competitors already coming to the United States, Toyota had no choice but to follow. But there was a lot they had to learn. Can they work with American suppliers or manage an American workforce? They judged that the lowest risk approach would be a joint venture with an American automaker. After an dalliance with Ford fell through, they struck a deal with General Motors, America's largest car maker. Why would GM want to work with their most formidable Japanese foe? Well, they had a gap in their portfolio that they wanted to fill, small cars, and they saw a possible technology transfer opportunity. NUMI was a 50-50 joint venture. GM contributed the facility, marketed the cars, and critically revealed to Toyota their suppliers. Toyota invested $100 million and ran the factory. NUMI's first CEO was Tatsuro Toyoda, son of Toyota Motors founder Kiichiro Toyoda. Toyota also contributed 30 to 50 of their managers for three to four years. GM was allowed to bring in 16 of their own managers too. Since NUMI involved two of the world's largest car makers, 
the Federal Trade Administration had to review it for antitrust issues. Ford and Chrysler even sued to stop the deal. But in 1984, the FTC approved the JV, limiting the company's life to 12 years. This sunset clause was later removed in 1993. NUMI would be built on the remains of the old GM Fremont plant. The GM Fremont plant first opened in 1963. At its peak in 1978, it employed 6,800 people. Its UAW-represented workforce was known for labor militancy. It was perhaps the worst performing of the 130 work sites run by GM, already a very badly performing company. Workers drank and smoked pot on the line, frequently struck without authorization, and filed thousands of grievances. Workers even put Coke bottles inside the door panels, so they rattled during the drive. Unexpected absenteeism reached 20%, especially on Mondays and Fridays. Workers recall some days where so few people showed up that managers would, quote, go right across the street to the bar, grab people out of there, and bring them in, end quote. The local union relished their national reputation for militancy against management. Factions inside the union even competed with each other to see who could sabotage or mess with GM the most. At the time GM closed the Fremont assembly plant in 1982, 5,700 people had been working at the factory. They all lost their jobs. Considering these issues, Toyota was understandably unsure about bringing back the old workforce. However, they were not able to wriggle their way out of it. The UAW had de facto control over the facility. A local official threatened to punch Toyota's union negotiator in the face simply for conveying these concerns. So in September 1983, Toyota recognized the UAW as the sole bargaining agent and agreed that the majority of Numi's people would be hired from the old GM Fremont workforce. And importantly, Toyota agreed that before laying off workers, the company would take other economic steps, including cutting management bonuses and operating hours. Hiring began in May 1984, with applications going out to the old GM Fremont workforce. People were selected on the basis of their humility, honesty, group orientation, listening ability, and communications. The GM Fremont workers were a bit older, average age 41. A quarter of them were Hispanic, 20% were black, and the vast majority were men. Almost all of them had only a high school education. A car in the NUMI system goes through the following production steps. First, the stamping plant. The stamping plant takes these large coils and sheets of finished metal and feeds them into these large stamping presses. These then stamp out hundreds of car parts, body panels, enclosures, brackets, and so on. Numi had its own stamping plant, which was kind of unusual. Most stamping plants serve multiple assembly plants near them, but being on the west coast, Numi is somewhat isolated. Second, we have the body shop. The body shop is where the various metal parts and pieces are welded together. A Numi car could have up to 3,800 welds. Third, we have the paint shop. We have to coat and seal the car's metal body, then we paint it in one of nine colors using four combinations of two-tone paint. Fourth, we have final assembly. The car's body sits on a line 1.3 miles long. Workers then add some 2,000 parts onto it as it makes its way down the line. Last and finally, we inspect the car and off it goes. When it opened, Numi was an average car assembly plant other than the integrated stamping plant. It was about 10 to 20% less automated than your typical GM plant, in part because its compact cars have less margin, making it harder to justify capital expenditures. By the 1980s, Toyota knew that part of its success can be attributed to its Toyota Production System, or TPS. TPS is quite famous, and I am not going to spend a lot of time on it here. However, let us walk through just a little bit. There are a few key concepts. Cars are made in a just-in-time fashion. Parts are produced in small batches, which are gathered on the line and replaced only when necessary. TPS also emphasizes the concept of teamwork and individual responsibility. Workers on the line are entrusted to flag errors as they occur, rather than to push them down the line for someone else to fix. If a worker on the line cannot fix the problem themselves in a certain period of time, there are a series of signals they can pull to stop the line for help. 
For instance, the famous Andon cord, actually a light signal. Andon is Japanese for paper lantern. You pull it and some music plays, alerting the group leaders. If the cord is not pulled again within a minute, the line stops. TPS is quite different from the old GM Fremont system. That old system was structured around a single central principle. The line must never stop. Stations on the line push their work down to the next station like water pouring down a river, no matter whether those guys were ready for it or not. Since everyone works at different paces, work in progress quote-unquote pooled at different spots on the river, in some cases up to two days worth of inventory. GM ran this line never stop system because on the surface stopping the line seems superficially expensive, about $15,000 for each minute. But as it turns out, it costs the company far more to keep pushing things down the line when those things are going wrong. Someone on the line notices an error on the line, judges it too insignificant to stop the line, and pushes it down the line anyway. But then that error compounds on top of others, like a ball of poo-poo rolling down a poo-poo mountain, until in the end we have this massive poo-poo ball rolling through the final car inspection phase. This would require substantial rework, often by the most highly paid and experienced workers. TPS rearranged the work progress by eliminating these pools of standing inventory and implementing a system where workers at an upstream station only produced a part when requested so by a station downstream via some signal. This allowed each worker to take time, identify, and fix errors before they become massive poo-poo balls. Think of it as kind of like links in a chain. You more easily find its broken links by pulling it tightly back rather than pushing it slackly forward. Toyota knew that they had to implement the system at Numi, which included the famous Andon cord. The GM side of management asked whether it would be wise to give workers the right to stop the line whenever they wished. Toyota's management replied, No, we intend to give them the obligation to stop it whenever they find a problem. All new hires went through a four-day orientation, and then 450 team leaders and group leaders were then sent to Japan for a three-week classroom and on-the-job training program. Numi adopted the Japanese spirit of heavy training. New production workers received over 250 hours of training in their first six months on the job, and 50 more hours of training each year thereafter. Typical American workers were lucky to receive 40 hours in their first six months, and 20 hours annually thereafter. In the old GM system, management held all the power, no matter how competent they actually were. Toyota, on the other hand, diffused certain responsibilities out into the hands of the workers. So rather than like a traditional military hierarchy, you had these small special forces units of four to six workers. These were all cross-trained in each other's tasks, ergo all the aforementioned training time. These teams coordinated with their upstream and downstream peers to determine the best way to work together. Toyota tried their best to translate Japanese-style concepts to the United States. For instance, it took a year to implement the concept of Ringi Sho, a bottoms-up decision-making process that relies on circulating proposals to as many people as possible, even those not involved, to obtain consensus. Production at Numi started slowly but the plant soon caught up. Work began in late 1984 with the Chevrolet Nova. Plant workers at first struggled to learn the new TPS system, and only 17 cars were produced in the entire first month. These Chevrolet Novas sold poorly. GM management didn't know they meant no-go in Spanish, so they switched to producing Corollas and later trucks. Numi's productivity vastly improved with this switch, since Corollas had been more optimally designed for the TPS system. By 1986, the number of hours it took for Numi to produce a car, adjusted for weld number, automation, car size, and other factors, far exceeded that of the old GM plant. It also exceeded that of a similar plant, GM Framingham, and nearly matched Toyota's core Corolla plant in Takaoka. Absenteeism fell from 20 to 25% to just 3 to 4%. GM Fremont closed with over 2,000 grievances outstanding. Numi had just 700 grievances its entire first eight years. 90% of employees at the factory described themselves as being 
either satisfied or very satisfied with their work. It wasn't all perfume and roses, however. One of the reasons why Numi performed so well after GM Fremont was that workers experienced a brutal year of unemployment after the layoffs and did not want to go through that again. 40% of the laid-off GM Fremont workers were still unemployed a year after the plant closed. Jobs paid about $13 an hour, more than most high school educated people can get at the time. Numi president Ken Higashi recalls that at the beginning the workers were just happy to have jobs with good pay and benefits, but the honeymoon soon ended and workers started grumbling about being pushed too hard. However, then things started to get difficult. Numi workers constantly worried about the plan's sustainability. The assembly line slowed down several times, hitting only 56% utilization in 1988. Throughout these tough times in the late 1980s, Numi held to its no layoff stance. Workers on the line were reassigned to other parts of the plant or given training. It was only after that, then, that workers realized that Toyota really did value them as part of the team. And Numi management paid a lot of attention to quote-unquote symbols of togetherness. Senior executives and line workers parked in the same lots, wore the same uniforms, and ate in the same cafeterias. It's not much, it seems, but it helped build that sense of teamwork that Toyota wanted. Back in 1980, Toyota would not have been able to build a factory in America alongside Honda and Nissan. Their key manufacturing people would not have supported it. But the turnaround at Numi gave Toyota confidence that they could bring a factory to the United States. Toyota now had experience in transplanting their operations culture and managing an American supply chain. Combined with the strengthening Japanese yen against the U.S. dollar, Toyota felt that a wholly owned American factory had financial advantages too. So as the setup work with Numi ramped down, Toyota went on to build a pair of new assembly factories in both Kentucky and Canada. Today, Toyota Motor Manufacturing Kentucky, whose workforce is not unionized, serves as one of the cores of the company's American operations. Technology transfer joint ventures like Numi are an opportunity for both sides to benefit. One of the reasons why GM Chairman Roger Smith went ahead with the JV was for his company to learn Toyota's production system, saying in 1989, why not take the opportunity to get an insider's view of how the Japanese do what they do? Numi's subsequent outperformance showed GM just how uncompetitive they had come to be, yet the company struggled to diffuse these lessons across the rest of the company. Part of this had to do with the company's resistance to change. One can make a valid argument that Toyota was more easily able to drive cultural change because of GM Fremont's closure as well as Numi's ongoing economic challenges. So when GM tried to implement some of Numi's lessons at another factory in Van Nuys a few years later, it didn't take. The Van Nuys plant managers were convinced that they did not need to change. The plant didn't improve, and GM eventually closed that plant in 1992. In 2010, General Motors, then suffering from financial issues, pulled out from Numi. By now, Numi was largely a Toyota plant. 90% of the cars they produced were Toyota cars. Despite continued excellence, Toyota no longer wanted to run the plant on its own. Perhaps because of its long-running financial struggles, isolation from the rest of the Toyota American supply chain, or its union presence. So Toyota shut the factory down. Numi's last car, a red Corolla, rolled off the line on April 1st, 2010. And then it was over. 4,500 people lost their jobs many after working for decades at the plant. A sad end to an underdog story. A few weeks later, in May 2010, Tesla Motors took over the facility, and today it now operates as the Tesla Fremont factory. Its workforce of some 22,000 people, far larger than Numi's ever was, is not unionized. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, uh, send me an email. I love reading your emails. And I'll see you guys next time.